Hey, Monday afternoon is here. Thank you all for must joining be, us. Must be time for a coffee break. Um, it is. It is time for a coffee break with Dr. Michael Stone and myself, Joe Lamb. Um, we're both physicians. We both have opinions about integrative medicine and functional medicine and about where things are going. Um, and today um, we wanted to talk about how well is well, because we talk a lot about optimal wellness, but what does that really mean? And we talk about it being a journey and not a destination, but still, if you're making a journey, you should have some idea about where you're going. So what is well, Dr. Stone? Well, that's a great question. For me, it's function. How well is my, my cognition? How well is my emotional? How well is my behavior? Can I do things physically? And, you know, what are the ways that we evaluate that day to day? Or have people on this call been somewhat like me who kind of put that on the last on the back burner for about 20 years and suddenly I wake up and, and wow, physically can't do some of the things that I used to be able to do, but it's time to get more well. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we've talked about the whole function model now for a while, you know, function being a measure of, you know, physical functioning at a, macro level of what we can see. So how we move our bodies, how we walk around, what we can lift, can we run at a micro level, you know, what our little mitochondria are doing, you know, how our DNA is replicating, the communication in the cells, all the things that we can't see. We've talked about, you know, the cognitive piece and the emotional piece, which are even more difficult to put a physical measure upon. And then we've talked about, you know, in many ways, the final piece of function, which is behavior, which is kind of the outward um, expression of all those kind of inward processes and balances and how well they're working. So, you know, it comes down to, you know, what you can do, but you and I may not want to do the same thing. So it enters into a whole discussion about what it is that um, you want to do. Exactly right. What is it that you want to eat? How is it do you want to move? How is it that you want to sleep? Do you want things to be more rejuvenative? Do you find that you do better on less sleep and what impact does that have? It's, it's, it ties into what do you want to do with well-being and also what do you want, how does your well-being impact, impact purpose? It's all those things. And then it rolls down to, oh my gosh, I'm hungry. What am I going to eat? And uh, I think as, a, as an American Polish guy, I think I'm driven a lot by Hey, I'm hungry. What do I want to eat? <laughs> yeah, I I have that dichotomy between, you know, having done cold poached salmon uh, on a salad with um, homemade deviled eggs and a pink peppercorn vinaigrette and some nice English cucumber and some grapefruit slices for one meal over the weekend. And then opening a cold can of Campbell's soup for lunch today and eating it straight out of the can without heating it up. So um, for me, it's time. And for me, it's setting that plays a role in what I want to do. Now, isn't that true? You know, we've been able to talk about that quite a bit. Um, you know, what? what's the most important, what's the most valuable commodity you have, and that's time. And uh, with enough time, 
um, and enough clarity, then we can make those a series of small, small choices that are so important that impact all the other aspects of our life, right? So, so you know, your drivers, your drivers. How do you how do you gather how do you gather yourself early in the morning um, t- to approach the day and and feel like you're you are in control of your day? Uh, what are the things that get you out of control, or have you reacting versus choosing? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, that how do you start your day piece goes to that whole frailty index that you and I were talking about during that conference call on the life house data today. And, you know, that, um, do you have the get up and go three to four? Do you struggle to have the get up and go three to four mornings a week? And that that's a measure of frailty and, um, and there were five criteria and having just even just one of them put you in the pre frail category. So, yeah. So those criteria, it's, it's pretty interesting, uh, the data on frailty and, and, and frailty ties into health and well-being, right? We know that people who are frail have a greater tendency for certain diets and they also have a greater tendency for earlier death and less mobility and more chronic condition. So is the chronic condition driving this frailty or is lifestyle driving the, the frailty? The answer to, the, to both those questions may be yes. But the, it's interesting, those five, those three general areas of frailty are looking at things from a physical dimension, a psycho, psychological dimension, and social dimension. So you talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, it's everything from eyesight to vision, I mean, vision to hearing to balance problems how often do we assess our balance so let me give you the five criteria that i i put on a slide one can you get up can you get up from a chair and walk four meters in less than six seconds well if you have sore joints if you have balance issues it may take you four seconds to get up and go um the other one is grip strength how is your grip strength is it equal how do you compare to people your age? There are tables for that. And Joe, you, we've, we've done grip strength testing in the LifeHouse project. Um, you already mentioned the third one, which is, um, do you wake up just a, tired? And is it hard to get going three to four days a week or all the time, five to seven days a week? And then the last one, which, which is really a lot in our control, uh, well, unintentional weight loss, four and a half kilograms or, you know, about about 10 pounds. Um, another frailty criteria is unintentional weight gain also. And then the last one is, do you exercise 30 minutes, five days a week or more? And if you have one or two of those, it's pre-frailty. And if you have greater than three, you're frail. And in a Canadian study, 20% of adolescents in Canada were pre-frailty, which causes you to lean forward and ask, so in our families, in our clinic, how many of our patients, how many of our family members are pre-frail? Yeah, well, I suspect from what you shared there that the get up and go question, which was kind of a subjective question that could be affected by mood, I would bet that's one of them that they're experiencing. And I would bet that the other one that's catching a lot of them out is the grip strength. Um, And lack of exercise. Yeah, that, that would get them three. But, you know, I think a lot of kids don't exercise and don't have much grip strength. Um, And, you know, um, it just, it's not, it's not the least bit surprising. So, you know, um, and you made a good point to circle back to something you said earlier. You know, what do you do? like for people to get them better in the issue of time. And Jeff Bland 
Dr. Jeffrey Bland, who is um, chief science officer at Metagenics for years and is now and was one of the two co-founders with his wife of the Institute for Functional Medicine and is now the, um, I don't know, director, president, whatever the term would be, um, head guru at Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Institute. Um, he said years ago that, you know, he said, what would be your one recommendation for everybody? You know, if you could do one thing for everybody, what would you do to improve their health? And his one thing was to give people an extra hour each day. Uh, it was kind of a cheat because he was like, well, the person who needs to home cook can home cook. The person who needs to exercise can exercise. The person who needs to take his supplements has time to take his supplements. But, you know, there really is a lot of wisdom in that. Yeah. So then the flip side of that is how do you, how do you create that time? Uh, yeah. of adding an hour of personalized, personal organization time, organization yeah. for health, you know, organization well, for well-being, you know. It's, um, I think it's partly about being intentional about set and setting. And you know, that's the term that's gained some popularity recently as people are exploring the psychedelics and talking about the difference between unguided trips and guided trips and preparing people, even people who are microdosing with the right environment to do it. But, you know, um, and, you know, there's that Grateful Dead song about what a long, strange trip it's been. But, you know, our health journey is also a long, strange trip for many of us. It's a lot of unknowns. Yes, yes. So that preparation, that that gaining that clarity about what you want the destination to look like, gaining clarity about where you are um, and about what you want to achieve is part of setting up that set and setting and hopefully it makes the trip um, less, maybe not less long because we all want long lives, but maybe it makes it less strange and less arduous to have defined what our wellness is. I think that's a good point and harken back a little bit. One of the guests we had uh, earlier this year in this year long journey of Monday afternoon coffee breaks was Kathy Snap. And she she would always put it. Maybe it, it builds on some of Lee Lipsensall's uh, um, counsel who, you know, enjoy every sandwich uh, uh, writer and uh, educator. And, and both of Mark and to enjoy simplicity. So what is the simplest way that we could impact our health? How do we enjoy that simplicity um, so we can do just one thing to improve our health? Not the whole plan, not the whole change in trajectory, but just, 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 just one thing to start. You know, every journey begins with a step, right? Right. I, I was going to quote, um, you beat me to it, but it's the J.R.R. Tolkien quote about Frodo and um, or I guess it was Bilbo actually who wrote who it's attributed to about taking that one step off your porch and it being dangerous because it sweeps you away. You know, you're suddenly in the stream, but you had to take that first step. And um, yeah you know, there and back again, you know, I mean, that's the title of um, The Hobbit, right? There and back again, yep. the subtitle. And, yep. you know, so I guess, you know, to me a little bit based upon what you said is just stepping up and taking a step no matter what it is, because the step isn't going to be the same for everybody. You know, um, That's correct. You, you know, you were outlining your new 
kind of framework in which you couch the nutritional physical exam and, um, you know, and talked about just, you know, asking the simple question, what do you eat as, yeah. you know, kind of a, as a starting point, a filter for where we may go. And, you know, we were talking about this earlier today, you know, part of this, how well is well is on what you measure, right? And, That's you exactly know, right. Um, if, you know, like we all know the problem with BMI, right? So, you know, body right. mass index theoretically tells us if we're well or not. But let's say we have someone with a body mass index of 28 and, you know, and, you know, if it's a man, let's say that puts you, you know, at, you know, 5'11", 230. Well, um, if all you know about that is the BMI, you don't know if they're healthy or not because they could be 5'11 and 230 and they could have biceps bigger than my arm and they could have a tiny waist and they could play linebacker, um, you know, for a professional football team. And then you have someone exactly the same age who um, who um, has it all around the waist and hasn't listed anything um, at all um, at any point in time, uh, except maybe a 12 ounce curl a couple times a day as they sit on the couch. So, um, you know, um, BMI doesn't get you there. But your question about mm -hmm. what do you eat, you know, like, you know, when we look at BMI, the, the way we all cheat in the exam room is we measure a waist circumference, which gives us a quick measure of is it visceral adiposity or is it something else? But, you know, um, that first question, you know, of making a distinction, if you've got someone who may be a normal BMI, who may exercise some, who may, you know, look pretty good in general, you know, not clinically depressed, but you ask the question of what they're eating and, you know, a good diet versus the standard American diet. And suddenly you know what you're potentially looking at and what's potentially broken and what needs to be examined more deeply. No, that's great. I think, um, you know, we were talking earlier, I, I just gave a talk in preparation for a, a, a conference in, in Great Britain, Michael Ash's group, um, clinical, clinical education group. And, and he asked me, what, what, are, what are a handful of questions you ask people to get a feel for how well they're doing? And it starts with, as you rightly said, what do you eat? And then the next question is, have you gained or lost any weight? Has your blood pressure changed? What about your hair? Has it changed? Has there been any thinning? Have you, can you tell if your smell and taste has changed? Do you have any sore gums or teeth? Do you ever notice that your breath changes and you have tongue coating or something on your tongue? What about skin changes, nail changes? What about do you feel your hands and feet like you used to, or are they really sensitive, or are they kind of numb, or are they tingling? And then finally, um, do you have any trouble with strength or balance? And yes to any of those questions really helps direct you and helps begin even further discussion about how well you are um, and allowing you to dive a little deeper into the nutrition of the person and act, action points that you can take. Yeah. Well, the one that jumped out at me was, you know, how do your hands and feet feel? And, you know, do you get tingling? Do you get coldness and all of that? And the reason I think that one struck me so much is two big areas that kind of differentiate an in integrative functional medicine approach is um, um, how we look at insulin resistance and how we look at thyroid hormone resistance. And, you know, exactly right. um, you know, we, we don't accept the absence of 
neuropathy as a sign that there isn't kind of preclinical changes going on in those small blood vessels due to, you know, insulin resistance. And instead we put a tuning fork on a toe and we see if the vibratory sense is abnormal or we see if someone's sense of balance is abnormal. And, you know, when someone says they have particularly cold feet and, or, you know, they've got thinning of their lateral eyebrows or their hands are cold or something's going on, you know, we don't just check a TSH and tell them it's good enough and you look okay. Um, you know, That's I can't right. tell you how many times I have someone who's symptomatic and you get a normal TSH and you measure um, autoantibodies against the thyroid and they actually have subclinical Hashimoto's. No, that's exactly true. You know, along those lines, it's interesting too, Joe, that when we start thinking about, and, and that leads to further questioning. So what I frequently see are people who, you know, are big wheat eaters and it's brominated wheat, or they live in a, in a um, they're very concerned about their teeth. So they have a lot of fluoride and then they live in a, in a uh, town that chlorinates the water. And then suddenly you're talking about three immediate competitors for iodine. And, and so it's interesting when you start looking at subclinical hypothyroidism with, with um, markers along those lines, uh, only about 50% of the vitamins on the market, a multivitamin, have any iodine in them. Yep. And people aren't eating iodized salt. And those things that are in the environment, we put in our toothpaste, the fluoride, we put in our water, chlorine, chlorine, and, and then we um, uh, and then we brominate by Senate, by Senate resolution, we brominate flour so that it has a longer shelf life. The amount of inhibitors or competitors for iodine in our system actually is pretty significant. So even in kids, even in kids um, who have fluoride treatments, you have to sometimes think about subclinical hypothyroidism and that's in the literature. Yeah. Well, and also given how many of us don't put much salt on our food these days because we're trying to be good. So we're missing our iodine the, the rising number of pregnant women who are iodine deficient and have a very low normal um, urine iodine is just remarkable. And, you know, a, a very derogatory term, cretin, was originally a medical term to refer to an infant who was born hypothyroid because mom didn't have enough thyroid hormone. And you right, know, we had the, yeah. go for we it. We had the goiter belts. We had the goiter belts, yeah. right? It's where yeah. iodine salt came in, is that we had whole sections of the country in World War I that, that the, the male soldiers were slower and weaker and weren't thriving. And they were coming from the iodine deficient belts of the North, of the North Midwest. Mm -hmm and a couple other places. And so that's why there was a whole push by Morton to iodize salt. Absolutely. And, you know, and we've taken, we've, we've um, made um, salt into like a villain. We villainized it. And um, it's not necessarily as bad for all of us as it could be. Um, so, you know, it's something to pay attention to. And I think that that's really the question. You know, uh, go back a few years and there were there was a big discussion, you know, going back to this body composition piece about whether or not there could be metabolically normal obese people. And right. uh, people would look at someone who very clearly had, you know, a high BMI, place them in the obese category, look at them and say, you know, yep, a lot of it's visceral adiposity, there's not much muscle mass, but you have a normal fasting blood sugar and you have 
um, a reasonably normal LDL cholesterol. Um, yeah, you're okay. You're metabolically normal. And yet, yeah. how far do you want to ask that question? You know, dive deeper. Do you want to get a hemoglobin A1C on that person? Do you want to get an insulin level and calculate a HOMA score? And when you do, you suddenly find out there aren't a lot of people um, at that level who are metabolically normal. And, you know, in the functional medicine model, and I think more people who are in the kind of research endocrinology model would agree with this, obesity is one of the early signs of the disordered pathophysiology that leads to diabetes. It's not the cause of diabetes. The physiology changed long before we became, you know, significantly obese. Obesity is that response to like insulin resistance where the muscle cell and the liver cell says, I'm not listening to insulin. And the fat cell goes, I'll listen. And you want me to take more energy and store it? Yeah, I can do that. Bring it on. Sure. You know, it, it, it may also tie into another mineral. So we talked a little about, about iodine and the and iodine wellness, well-being, subclinical hypothyroidism. Insulin sensitivity is so sensitive, is so responsive to magnesium and the hypomagnesemic person, somebody who's not eating enough mag magnesium, that just by adding a, a few hundred milligrams of magnesium a day can improve that insulin sensitivity. Um, you know, I think when we start really looking at, at minerals, uh, minerals and health, um, we have to recognize that most of the minerals we get from food, but the mineral supply in food has decreased between 40 and 60 percent the levels that they were in the in 1930s to 1950s in our food supply. So we really have to start thinking a little bit deeper about, um, so we're gaining weight. Are we gaining weight because we're having trouble getting rid of toxins? Are we gaining weight because we have more insulin uh, resistance? Are we gaining weight because we're not moving too much, is not sleeping seven to eight hours a day? Um, are we totally stressed and we're in this hypercortisolemic a situation. I mean, it's just how well is well, and how well are you, and how well am I, and right. um, well, and that's the opportunity that we have during this pandemic because it's helped uncover some of the challenges in our comorbidities and our wellness, our wellness meter. Yeah, well, it's made people a little bit more aware of the comorbidities, that insulin resistance has a consequence. Um, and, you know, it goes yeah. right back to what you were saying about toxicity. Um, you know, if you have oxidative reductive imbalances, right? Like there's too much oxidative stress in your body. One of the consequences of that is the mitochondria in the beta cell hypersecretes insulin. So just something that stresses the mitochondria, like excess iron, is enough to yep. make um, you hyperinsulinemic. You don't need excess fat. You don't need excess sugar. You need iron. And um, iron has gone up dramatically in our diet during the time that we've been low fat, interestingly enough. Even though you showed that piece today about how many young women, um, and it was a marked distinction, like 25% of people in Britain were, um, were iron deficient if they were women, and they were in their 20s, right? And 25% yep. of women in their 20s were iron deficient and only 1% of males. Um, and despite that horribleness, um, and it's probably explained by the source of the increased iron. But as we've gone to a low fat diet, you know, like you eat a four ounce hamburger, which used to be 50% fat or, you know, or 40% fat or 30% fat, let's, you know, 50 for the math sake, you got two ounces of fat and two ounces of muscle protein that had iron in it. Now you've made that, you know, 
um, 90 percent lean four ounce burger and so suddenly you've got 3.6 ounces of muscle and iron versus um, 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 you know 0.4 ounces of fat so you've had an 80 percent increase in the amount of iron that you're taking in um, you know it's kind of you know we don't think about those consequences even things that we think are um, beneficial for us. And, and, you know, it may be that a lot of young women don't eat a lot of meat these days. Yeah, and I think it also points out the, we've chatted about it a few times, all, almost uh, so many of the nutrients we look at in isolation have a U-shaped curve. So if you have too much or too little, it's an issue. Right. And I also think it comes around to coming back to since suddenly a half hour is burned up um you know the simple question uh what do you eat if it's if it's only supplements and a very spartan anything else then you're not getting all the nutrients you need because of the beauty the beauty of the four to six thousand different phytochemicals phytonutrients in our in our rainbow of colors and fruits right so you know we have to go back it has to start with food and how do we how how do we ha find that middle spot between your can of cold campbell soup and and that elegant meal that you described with poached salmon where is that middle spot and can we create and organize our day so we can have the most healthful um honoring of our body by uh choosing what we can eat in a way that is the most helpful in our situation. Absolutely. So how well is well? Well, well is being able to do the things that you want to do with ease. And if you're not able to do that, then you really need to reach out to someone who will explore that. If you go into a practitioner's office, and they tell you your symptoms don't matter because you have a normal blood test, it's time to go somewhere else. Dr. Stone's down in Ashland. I'm up here in Gig Harbor, and we both do some telemedicine visits. So we're here for you. And if you want to talk more about the journey and more about you know, really defining what is well, um, we're having... 90 minutes of recreation, recreation, and visioning Saturday morning, the 24th. So this Saturday, 9 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, and we'll be joined by Susan Buell and Courtney Souter. And we'll talk about the work that we're getting ready to do in the future. And um, a shout out to all the people who listen to us and comment. We appreciate those. And um, we'll see you all later this week. Have a good evening.